This episode of Blue Grip Podcast is sponsored by McLean Advisors, proud Ruby sponsors of the 2024 TMPA and Texas FOP Conference. Especially when we're asking them, we're not asking them to go out and pick the right choice, make the right choice in any given situation. There is, There are no good choices very often by the time law enforcement gets summoned, especially at 3 in the morning. These officers are being asked to go out there and in an emergency in a split second, make the least bad choice. Welcome back, viewers, watchers, listeners. I'm your host, Tyler Owen. We have a guest host today, the big boss, the man, the myth, the legend, TMPA's executive director, Kevin Lawrence. What's going on? Man, you need to just go around the state and introduce me everywhere I go. It just builds my ego up. Well, you know what? We actually probably need to travel the state and do like we did, or you did, several years ago. Uh, you did like a around the state tour, and you were it was during the, the height of the of the George Floyd deal, and it, it was uh, seemed successful. Actually, that was pre-George Floyd. Was it? It was uh, post-Ferguson. Ah, okay. And... Uh, Trying to go around and meet with all the media outlets, the local editorial boards, that is what you're talking about? Yeah. Trying trying to counter the misinformation, disinformation that was being put out. Uh, yeah, because after George Floyd, COVID hit, and there were no, no. opportunities. <laughs> no, to you're that right. Yeah. Stuff, Ferguson. So. Talk about that real quick. I think it's important, uh, your experience. <clears throat> I had this conversation today with a, with a, a deputy, of, I forgot what county, but he was so afraid to talk to the media. And there was an issue going on with their local association where we really needed, uh, and it was important for the local association to really have that voice because, you know, the, the, the reality is, is that if like, let's just say it's San Marcos, Texas, they may n- kind of know what TMPA is, but they're going to know who Hayes County Sheriff's Association is or Hidalgo County. Uh, and talk about the importance of, of why it's important for local associations to have those relationships with their media outlets. Well, you know, the first thing I'm going to talk about is why it's it's so much more difficult for officers who work for sheriff's offices or for counties. Yeah. Um, and and this is not – I don't even know which county you're talking about, and I don't want to know. Right. But just from a 30,000-foot view, the – I guess you could say 33,000. <laughs> okay, 33,400 <laughs> feet. Yeah. Um, when you work for a sheriff's office – you work for a, a constitutionally elected official mm-hmm. who does not answer to the commissioner's court, does not answer to the county judge. And so whether or not the county has any authority whatsoever to overrule a seated sheriff on a disciplinary action is one in a hundred, maybe. Maybe. Because there's only a handful of counties in Texas that have any type of civil service whatsoever, any type of meaningful due process when it comes to your job. Mm-hmm. So the only recourse we have for the vast majority of, of sheriff's departments in Texas is if you are fired because you came out and made some public comment is to go to district court and file some sort of a First Amendment claim you know, freedom of speech claim, something along those lines. So that's why it's it's exponentially more difficult for county employees to get in the middle of stuff like that than it is for officers who work for cities or school districts or, you know, because they work for somebody who is hired and fired by the elected body yep. of that, you know, governmental subdivision. So, A, let's let's make sure we're cognizant of that fact. B, it is critical and if the sheriff or the chief or the mayor is thinking properly and getting good legal advice, they want their employees to have a police association, a union, a yep. lodge, whatever we want to call it in that particular jurisdiction. They want them to be constantly in communication with the voters and keeping them informed about what is truly going on. Okay, Assuming those administrators and officials are doing their jobs properly. They want that additional information flow, you know, and they want to, they want to work as partners and as teammates. And there are protections out there that exist for the association that don't exist for the individual employee, even at sheriff's offices, even at constable's offices, there are protections, you know, the, the freedom of assembly in the first amendment extends to labor organizations. A lot of people don't realize that. Yep. The right to redress grievances 
extends to labor organizations. We might have to enforce it in district court, but there still are protections out there that don't apply to you as an individual, but they do apply to the, and I hope I'm not just guessing the right county accidentally, but they do apply to the employees of the San Saba County Sheriff's Office. It wasn't San Saba. Okay, good. <laughs> no, it wasn't San Saba. But, yeah, anyway, we we had that discussion, and uh, it, it proved rewarding for me uh, back when I was a president of my local association in East Texas. And, you know, now being in this role, uh, I'm constantly – Speaking with media and speaking, you know, to, to, to news reporters and, uh, man, it's it's so beneficial for you guys out there, the membership body, for us to have those relationships. Because if we have a situation going on, you know, maybe there are bad results of a management survey or, you know, politics are involved. We can reach out to those partners and say, hey, I, I, I had the situation. Can you help me out? So just want to touch on that. Yeah. But anyway. Anything else going I mean, on? We got one of those bad management surveys going on right at the moment. Yeah, we, uh, we probably don't want to talk about we, it. Yeah, I'm I'm game. Let's yeah. go. Yeah. Well, you know a lot more about it than I do. I, I again, I'm I'm getting this just from, uh, uh, you know, a very, you know, distant information <laughs> flow. Well, uh, I, what I what I will tell you is this: is that um, for those that, that are listening that are that are in leadership at your local association, TMPA uh, will come in and complete management surveys at the local association's request. Uh, but I don't want to 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 give the perception to the member out there that that's 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 what we're going to do every single time, and then we're just going to drop a bomb when we get the results. Yeah, we, it should be done only as an absolute last resort. That's right. Have, yeah, once you have exhausted all other possible remedies, all other possible avenues, only then should we do a management study. And and the reason is management studies, somebody's going to get bloody. It yep. doesn't make any difference you know, which direction it goes. Somebody's going to get bloody. Very often, the administration will come out right away and try to diffuse everything by claiming that whatever the issues are that are being raised, it's just a, it, and I love the expression, they always say it's just a handful of malcontents. It's always just a handful of malcontents that are stirring up all this trouble. Right. And uh, sometimes that's true. And if that is true, that is what we will find out once we do the management study. Generally though, where there's smoke, there's fire. So, you know, the, in in the old days, labor organizations would do votes of no confidence, <laughs> which is are commonly misphrased a vote of confidence, but that's never what they are. They do a vote of no confidence. But all that does is say we don't like this person or we do like this person. It doesn't really quantify or qualify what the issues are. So a management study is the modern scientific method of really – we got morale issues. We got personnel <laughs> issues. We got recruiting retention issues. Let's drill down deeper. And I can't explain how the the difference between these two things. But when you do surveys, when you do data collection, you can do it two different ways. You can do, and and Doctor Olbrick can explain this a lot better than I can. There is a simple frequency distribution that you can use to, to analyze that data. And then there's something called a regression analysis. And that's when you can draw uh, nexuses between the answer to this question and the answer to that question. Huh. So yes, my morale is low and here's why. Yeah. That's, that's what you can prove <coughs> through a management study a survey. And the, then, you know, there's a process you need. Once you've done that, we need to understand we're going to sit down with management, mm -hmm. show them the results, and try to work with them to address the issues. We're not – the purpose here is not to get rid of anybody because I, I promise you, if you want to get rid of your chief, it's really not that hard to get rid of a chief. Finding a better chief, that's the That's problem. the hard. Yeah. <laughs> yep. It yep. can always get worse. And I'm going to tell you something. You just you said that you weren't really sure or, or you were unclear of the differences between a voter no confidence and a management survey. Uh, when I was local of my association, I was before I came to work with TMPA, I uh, had a situation where I was in front of the body of our association with our city manager, and we were having very, 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 very difficult times with our police chief. Uh, Clint McNeil was involved. You were involved at some point. 
And it came down to <laughs> me ignorantly uh, asking the body who in here is dissatisfied with his leadership and the entire body raised their hand in front of the city manager. So essentially we gave him a no confidence vote with, and I did it ignorantly. And I'm, I'm going to tell you, uh, Kevin, that was probably the biggest regret of my association leadership days because uh, moving forward, the association members themselves, because I was the president, right? So the association members themselves thought, you know, I don't like these days off. And so they would call it, they would, they would expect that the association can flex at any point in time. And we kind of wasted a lot of our political capital within the department. We set our political capital outside with the citizens, but it almost hurt us. Uh, and it hurt the morale of the department in a sense of entitled. Does that make sense? It does. It makes perfect sense. And it, it was what, bad. May, what may not make perfect sense to some of the folks that are watching is exactly what is political capital. Yep. And I think we could spend an entire episode oh, just on that. 100%. Yeah. About how critical it is. And, you know, in in 30 seconds or less, political capital is what kind of relationship do you have with your voters, with your citizens, with the people that you serve day in and day out? Have you banked enough goodwill with them mm-hmm. that when you need their help with something, you can turn to them and ask them for that? Yep. Some agencies, some locals have really, really, really good relationships, and therefore they have banked a lot of political capital. Most departments don't spend nearly enough time working on it. No, no. But, but they do like to complain when things are not going. And, you know, the old joke is there's only two things cops don't like. There's change. Yep. And then there's the status quo. Other than that, we like <laughs> yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah. Well, <clears throat> speaking of the situation of the management survey, uh, TMPA recently, uh, we've been, been in the news a little bit in Houston, Texas City area. Uh, we completed a management survey, uh, and I got to hand, I got to give it the hats off. I know we give Leighton Ganeri so much crap and hell, but he did this one exactly right. We give him crap and hell only because rightfully he so. Yeah, that's right. He's an LSU fan, and plus, he's just if you know Leighton, you know what I'm talking about. So. Uh, he got the results of the management survey, attempted to reach out to the chief. Uh, that was uh, canceled 15 minutes before the can- the meeting was supposed to happen, and then that resulted in Layton reaching out to the mayor and uh, requesting a meeting, and that, that was ignored. So then you're kind of left in a situation where, um, you know, what do you do now, right? So the local association came out with a statement, and that was responded by the mayor. And I've got a lot of questions this week. The information that he put out there, uh, one would deem it was personal and probably too much information out there. And then I got a lot of questions about, man, but that was G file information. You know, it's something we're looking into, uh, without concrete evidence. We don't know, but yeah, it's a, it's a debacle at Texas city. Well, that's, a, that's about what I've heard is that the, the, the mayor probably appointed the wrong person to be chief mm-hmm. for the wrong reason mm-hmm. and is now refusing to even, talk about the resulting problems that have been created by yep. that. So, yeah, it's a, uh, anyway, but while we're doing this podcast, you still got men and women in Texas city that are serving and protecting their, their, their community. And just of yesterday, we got to uh, notify that the assistant chief, who's also, uh, we have back, you know, we have data to prove it uh, based off the votes that his leadership style is also somewhat controversial <laughs> And uh, retaliatory is the best way to say it. And uh, I just got notified yesterday that the once approved outer carriers that a lot of you guys love uh, for the heat, they're really good in the summertime, and the old school polyester uniforms that you probably wore uh, day in and day out at Baytown, uh, they're reverting back to those. So just to kind of you know, poke them in the eye a little bit. So a lot of retaliatory stuff going on. Like you just poke me in the eye with the I mean, I wasn't, joke about my yeah, age. Yeah. No, I wasn't saying your age. I was yeah, just yeah. saying that you served our state well and, and just during a time that, that seemed like almost wool uniforms were like a thing. When uh, <laughs> I, I noticed that we got an email either late last night or this morning from an officer who had just re- resigned yeah. from that to Texas City. Yep. Um. And that email was basically saying, I just I'm I just can't put up with this environment anymore. I'm out of here. Please look out for the all the other officers that are still there, the ones that are still trying to go out there and take care of the citizens and, and serve the community. 
I've gotten phone calls from old retirees from that department basically saying, man, isn't there something we can do to help these officers because it's the environment in there over there is just so untenable. Well, um, the, the, the mayor has met TMPA and I, I don't think we're, we're not going anywhere. We're going to stand behind our members and do what would do what's right. And, uh, don't know how long this fight's going to be with the city, but we're going to continue to serve every day. And, and, uh, I guess we'll be up there later on. And ultimately it's, it's up to the voters. Yeah. The voters are the ones that have to fix problems like this. They need to recognize that, um, they need to be, sending a clear message to their elected officials, either do what's best for, for the city, do what's best for public safety, or we will find somebody else who will. Yep. Yep. I agree. Well, speaking of elected officials, uh, you know, it's a very interesting to me. I, I, I tend to kind of go the route of like not liking a, an individual that we may be, in, you know, dealing with on a professional basis, just based off the way they've treated, you know, other cops. And I kind of get this preconceived notion and, and, mentality about them but it's weird because if you sit down with, with, with majority of people you actually have so much in common more than what you think and i think you had that mindset several years ago you and steve foster uh y'all have maintained and started a what was called then facebook live group that's included multiple uh law enforcement you know individuals some elected officials some state reps uh and y'all y'all created this deal and it's it's been really successful and we are going to turn it, I think, into a semi-show. We don't know. We haven't really come up with the concrete because if there's one thing about my boss I know. When I mention something like, hey, we're going to do this show. It's going to be called this. And he's not like his eyes don't look at me a certain way. I know for a fact that he's kind of hesitant about it. So we haven't come up with a, a show name yet. But I kind of want, I think it should be important to, to turn it into uh, like a podcast. Sometimes I may be looking at you like that because I've got this idea in my mind of something that's completely inappropriate. <laughs> yeah. To and, say that. And, and that, that, that one little gene that people don't think I have is actually working and saying, yep. now nah, you better not say that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you mentioned Steve Foster. Steve is an attorney who I first met Steve when he was relatively young, relatively new <laughs> out of law school, but he was working as general counsel for the criminal justice committee in the Texas Senate. Okay. Uh, when Ken Arbrister was chairman of that committee, Ken, Ken is an old uh, Victoria police officer who became, he, he rose to the rank of lieutenant and then got elected to the Texas Senate. Wow. So he retired from law enforcement and then uh, spent the rest of his career in, in state politics. But Steve was his legal person, his, his general counsel on the committee. And so we got to know Steve very well, developed friendship with him, and we've just stayed in touch over the years. Um, so then in just jumping forward a couple of decades, in 2020, uh, shortly after the George Floyd incident, I, my wife and I were actually in San Antonio. We were down on the river walk doing something. My phone rings and it's Steve. And I'm like, hey, man, how, how are you? We, you know, we go through our pleasantries. And he said, hey, listen, he said, I really think that we need to team up and get out in front of the unrest that is stirring. And, and by the way, San Antonio was the, the, the city was busy putting out barricades because they were prepping for the demonstrations yeah. slash riots that were about to happen. And while I'm watching that go on, Steve calls me and says, I really think it's not. A, he said, I'm. I'm now on the uh, African-American lawyer section of the state bar. And I think we could get together and work with law enforcement groups like TMPA and at least talk about where do we go from here? How do we address yep. this? How do we, how do we not let this thing turn into a powder keg? And I said, man, we're in Te count us in. How, how do you want to make this happen? So that resulted in, uh, him getting other members of the African-American lawyer section. And I reached out to HPOU, Dallas Police Association, Harris County Deputies Organization, DPSOA, uh, and, and we started having conversations. Yeah, we called them Facebook Live. We would do them like every yeah. Wednesday, every other Wednesday. And we would just get on there for an hour and talk back and forth. And and what we what we quickly found was, 
We've got a lot more in common, a lot more things that we agree on than what we disagree on. We simply don't take the time to listen to the other person's side, the other yep. point of view. There's a lot to be learned, a lot to be gained from hearing what their perspectives are and from them hearing. And, and this is where I, I developed this understanding relatively late in my career. The better our citizens understand why law enforcement does what it does the way we do it, the better off we're going to be. Yeah. It's when they just don't understand, when they just see a video of like this most recent one where the cop shot the woman with the pot of boiling water. Yeah. If you have no foundation about exactly what led up to that, that video is extremely difficult to watch. Yeah. Once you have the full background, it might make a whole difference to how you view that video. The citizens need a better understanding. And we as law enforcement, and I, and I put this blame on city attorneys, county attorneys, district attorneys, law enforcement agencies, chiefs and sheriffs, when something happens, they're told, don't say anything. Don't come out publicly. You know, don't make any every, answer needs to be no comment, no comment, no comment. For, for, for the sake of the investigation. For the sake what for whatever. So we lose the support of our own citizens because of the perception that we're covering things up. We need to be as transparent as we possibly can and, and let them understand this is what we can share with you. And by the way, we're willing to talk to you about why we're willing to show you how our officers are trained. You know, you did a great job of putting together um, where we brought in the Austin justice coalition yeah. and had them go through some simulations with us some mm -hmm. out on the range. Uh, and what was his comment at the end of it? A guy that's anti-law enforcement hates cops. Well, I shouldn't say hate cops. At least that was the perception to us, right? The law enforcement world who went through that training. And what was his comment? Completely changed his opinion. Completely changed his opinion. I, I love the fact that, that, that I don't remember if it was it was him or one of the other gentlemen that was with him who said, "Yeah, I'd have shot every one of them." <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's crazy because you're not you, you don't face those 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 moments every day, but we do. And right. I mean, just like this morning, I had a conversation with a local district attorney uh, that was blown away. In a certain county, they are required to fill out use of force documentation every time their gun leaves the holster. Now, how many times? And and you worked it. Baytown, you you worked you 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 had a, you had a, you had some experience and and I don't and I mean this lovingly like it was there were some dangerous city, cities that you worked in. Yeah, I worked for Baytown <laughs> when Baytown you know wasn't cool. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a country song. Yeah, so. uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I probably two times a shift uh, in Marshall at least, and I would have had to fill out use of force documentation for that. I mean, that's just it, yeah. It, I don't. I don't see how we how we would be able to 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 sustain that because, you know, the, I developed a habit of especially on night shifts yes. when you get out on just a traffic stop. Mm -hmm. If there's anything about that car that you just you, you get that that little gut feeling, that little you know pit of your stomach kind of thing, you you walk up, you go ahead and draw your pistol, and you put it down by, beside your thigh. And you walk up this direction with that pistol down here. And once you get up there, they don't know you've drawn your pistol. Mm -hmm. And if everything checks out okay, you very but when you holster put it back. But when you holstered and you have it out, how 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 are you doing it to where it wasn't public perception and to where you, the, the person you're dealing with is not going to not elevate the, 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 the situation, but you're doing it in a way that, that's not going to alarm Correct. Who you're contacting. I was able to do it. Discreetly. 90, 99.9% .9 of the time in a way they never knew I That's had right. my weapon drawn. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I was ahead of the game if something went, went afoul and I was immediately had a gun pointed at them and could give them directions. And so, but the current policies that have, that most agencies and accreditation bureaus are now pushing is I would have had to, to, Submitted a use of force report on every single one of yeah. those. It's crazy. No, it just it, it's just too burdensome. Yeah, I mean, you know. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention, by the way, that came out of these conversations with Steve and and Rudy Matire, by the way, is the uh, executive director of the African American Caucus Association. charitable arm yeah. of okay. the African American Caucus in the in the state legislature, and. 
he he's also a city councilman in, in Pflugerville. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then Nikki uh, is an attorney in, in Dallas, Fort Worth area, who's also part of that. We've had these conversations, and one of the points we've been trying to make to him, and, and one of the big fallacies of the police reform movement is the assumption that bad policing happens because of bad police officers. And one of the things I think we've been able to demonstrate to them is, and by the way, we acknowledge bad policing happens. Bad policing happens a lot more yep. than we want to admit, but it does happen. At a very small rate, though. It is a very small yep. rate. It, it, and you know, the vast majority of the time, cops get it right. They do the best they possibly can, right. especially when we're asking them. We're not asking them to go out and pick the right choice, make the right choice in any given situation. There is there are no good choices very often by the time law enforcement gets summoned, especially at three in the morning. These officers are being asked to go out there in, in an emergency in a split second, make the least bad choice. Yeah. <laughs> and, and yeah that's right. Don't I never thought of that, that about the jobs that we have. And so we've had a chance to to dissect that with them. Bad policing generally happens because of lack of something. Lack of manpower, lack of equipment, training, lack of communication, communication yeah. lack of training, or bad something. Bad policies, bad leadership, bad management, bad you know, bad whatever we want to talk about. And so if we're going to address bad policing and we're only going to focus on bad police officers, we're not going to fix the problems we're trying to fix. And I, and that's part of what has come out of these conversations. Well, and a great point. Back to like the, let's say the Austin riots, right? For the life of me, I can't understand. And we've had this discussion with people in that DA's office that explain to me where the mindset of, of, of indicting cops were – as it came down to it, my understanding, and, and I wasn't living down here at the time, but the main one of the key pieces of evidence is that the uh, the ammunition was expired, and there was a problem with the ammunition. Is that that's accurate, right? That was what we were told at one point, right? And so I don't, for the life of me, can wrap my brain around the fact that it's okay. So the department negligently provided the ammunition. He was justified at potentially shooting, but because the ammunition was bad. That's that's a violation. And it's just, and it goes back to your point that it, 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 it being being educated and teaching people about use of force and doing the things and why we do it. Um, maybe we'll get there one day. Maybe we won't. I don't know. Well, I think, I think when it, the problem to me is when you're looking for a reason to charge somebody or looking for a reason to indict somebody, rather than just following the evidence where it takes you. Yep. That's where the problem comes in. And I believe a lot of this is simply political posturing by prosecutors who are themselves elected officials. And and by the way, I, I also want to defend them a little bit. This this failure on law enforcement's part to be completely transparent or as transparent as we possibly can leads to the impression that things are being hidden from the public. And the way our grand jury system works, and I'm not saying I disagree with it, but because it's secret, not open to the public, and nobody who ever testifies in a grand jury can actually say, tell anybody what happened inside the grand jury, it feeds that perception yeah. that we are operating under cloak and dagger circumstances. And so the, some of these DAs are doing this just simply because they don't want to take on the responsibility of telling the voters the officers didn't do anything wrong. That's why I'm not charging them. That's why I'm not indicting them. And they want to put that off on a grand jury. Part of it is also the attitude of let's just take it to trial, and then it does become a completely open public Well, but they're spectacle. doing that for, for political reasons because that way they won't be the fall guy. Okay. What? I mean. <laughs> I get it. But, yeah. you know. We we can talk all day long yeah. about how we are held to a higher standard. If the citizens can't see us being held to a higher right. standard. And by the way, this is also something that's different in Texas. Even on disciplinary actions, in other states, disciplinary actions and the appeal of disciplinary actions are not open to the public. Really? The people don't understand that in Texas – for those agencies where you do have some kind of due process, not most sheriff's departments, I'll bring us back to the beginning of this whole conversation. Cities, for example, like Austin, that have civil service, 
where if you are terminated or you're suspended for 15 days or whatever, you can appeal that either to the Civil Service Commission, which is a civilian review board, or to an independent third-party hearing examiner. Those are open to the public. Those hearings, you know, the media can go in there and film the whole thing. We're used to that in Texas. We're good with that in Texas. We believe if we didn't do anything wrong, we should we be put get back to work. Yep. We should, you know, if we did something wrong, why are we appealing it? We should take our punishment and move on. It's just that simple. And the, But in other states, those are not open to the public, and it further feeds that perception that we are operating under Cloak and dagger, I think is what you said. Cloak and dagger, you know, situations under veil. You know, that's why so many people have a problem with qualified immunity. They think it somehow is more of that cloak and dagger persona of law enforcement, and that's just not the way. It, it, yeah. it's, it's certainly not the way it has ever been in Texas. Well, I did not know that about outside of Texas. Of course, I wouldn't. I mean, I, I thought East Texas was its own country until about uh, two there years are, ago. There are other states where, like, there are there are about a hundred agencies in Texas that actually have collective bargaining for their labor issues, for pay, benefits, working conditions, whatever. A hundred out of twenty nine hundred have some sort of bargaining. In Texas, those bargaining sessions, the negotiation sessions, are also public meetings. They are open to the general public. They have to be posted 72 hours in advance, so on and so forth. In other states, they not only aren't open to the public, a lot of times they're not open to the members that they're being that are <laughs> oh, being wow. represented. In the, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. If, even the officers can't go in and watch the negotiations. Take that doesn't place. make any sense at all. But I, you know, I can't answer for New York and Michigan and Pennsylvania and how they do things. Well, but – uh, we, we were going to probably segue into a good, good time to segue. Speaking of New York and Massachusetts and all those other states, we have been kind of connected to Texas FOP from a uh, association standpoint for a number of years now. We had a big election this week, uh, the, two weeks ago at the conference. Uh, this is our second, is this our second annual conference together? Cause COVID we had the 18 and, in, in, uh, Horseshoe Bay or it's third. It's, it's the third. It's the third combined conference yes. it's the first truly joint conference yeah though. well because before we it, it, you i mean and this wasn't a pun on our, our planning and execution it's just the way it was where we would have tmpa conference and then some people that were boat or dual members would have to run down the hallway for one one portion of the fop conference it just wasn't it wasn't enjoyable right yeah. this was the uh this year, man, it was. This was one of the best conferences I've ever been to. It's it, the history of this thing, the, the the genesis of this whole thing. It's 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 difficult to explain to people just just how much how many hurdles had to be overcome. Yep. And the first attempts to get TMPA and FOP to somehow coalesce started way back in the nineties when I was on the TMPA board and. They fell apart fairly quickly and just created a little more animus than we had starting out. We started that process again in 2011, 2012, 2013, fell apart again. FOP is a different type of organization. It's a lodge system where each lodge is subordinate to the lodge above it. TMPA is not like that. We don't have a mothership of any yeah. kind. We don't serve as a mothership to our local associations. Our local associations are autonomous. Our members are not beholden to us. They don't have to stay with us. The local associations can choose to affiliate, but they're not re- required to in any right. way, shape, or form. And it, it, it's almost like there's just this fundamental philosophical difference about the structure of the organizations that has to be overcome. There's also the fact they only have their conference every other year. Yeah, We have a conference every year. They elect their board of directors every other year. We elect our board every year. Um, the uh, Again, the difficulty that created. So the first time we actually had a conference together at the same place was, yes, 2018 at Horseshoe Bay. God, it was beautiful. Oh, it was a great conference. <laughs> great facility. Great facility. Great facility. But we had TMPA having meetings in one room while FOP was having meetings in another room. And like you say, people that were (laughs) trying to run back and forth and navigate both. And um, that was actually when I got elected to the FOP state executive board. I thought so. I couldn't remember what year that was. Uh, So since then, we had – TMPA didn't have a conference in 20 because of COVID. Mm -hmm. FOP managed to do one that was kind of a hybrid of – 
virtual, virtual and yeah. in person. Um, they did it later in the year than they normally would have. So there was not one that, uh, uh, you know, a uh, combined conference that year. 2022, we did the combined conference in San, in San Antonio. Good. But once again, we were in separate rooms. And now that I was executive director of one, chairman of trustees for the other, you can imagine how I was getting pulled back and forth. Uh, same thing for a couple of other people. This was the first time that we actually got together and had our conferences in the same big ballroom at the same time and simply switched who was on the dais yeah. back and forth so that FOP could conduct their business and have their elections. TMPA could conduct their business and have their elections, but still share information, you know, to, to everybody in the room at the same time. And, the, you know, folks don't understand the, the biggest reason, the, the biggest incentive for TMPA members to become part of FOP is that FOP is, in fact, the only game in town in Washington, D.C. Yeah. Um, if you go to the White House or you go to Congress and you watch them, you listen to their, their committee hearings, their deliberations, Every time a law enforcement issue comes up, somebody, whether it's the vice president of the United States or the president of the Senate or the speaker of the House or the chairman of that committee, somebody says, what does FOP say about this? Because mm-hmm. they are the big guns. They got 370 something thousand members. And I say they. 78. Yeah. You and I are both. Yeah. FOP members. Like say, I'm on their, their state executive board. I'm on their national legislative committee. We need to not just be part of that effort. We need to be a major player in that effort. We need to be having a a huge impact on what FOP is telling the White House and the Congress and all those federal agencies because they're making decisions every day that affect our members, not only in their jobs, but in their day-to-day lives. Yep. And we need to be doing everything we can up there to represent the interest of our members. And FOP is the best way to do that. So having said all that, FOP sees Texas as important, too, as evidenced by the fact that every member of the National Fraternal Order of Police Executive Board was at this conference. Yeah. Every one of them showed yep. up. Yep. So, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was great to see it. I mean, and I felt – I'm going to say this, and it may be twisted up, but, you know, Conferences prior to this are always a good time. It's always feels like a huge family reunion. My, you know, my wife does. Uh, she's she kind of handles the purse bingo, so uh, it, they're great. Anybody who hasn't been to the purse bingo, by the way, bring your spouse, bring your wife. Yeah. It's great. It's a, it's a it's everybody a good time. Everybody who's done it loves it. Yeah. Um, but this conference, there was a, there was a sense of pride and a sense of. Um, unity that I've never felt at any other conference before. And again, this is the third conference we've had together, uh, but this was the true combined. And it was, since it was the first true joint conference, Maybe there that were was hiccups. It. There were hiccups. There's no doubt about it. Not many. <laughs> there, you know, the ones that were, the ones that happened were behind the scenes yeah. for the most part. Mm-hmm. There really wasn't, I don't think the members or the, the vendors or the guests that were there no. had any idea that stuff was going on. There's still going to be some of that, though. There's still some some disagreements and yep. some hurdles that still need to be overcome. But, you know, I think we have – we certainly are as close to making this thing a reality as we've ever been. And I think we have long since passed the point of no return. Yeah, I think so. I hope so. Well, uh, planning the conference hasn't come easy. Our staff, uh, Shelly – Alicia Mupo, and we've used it. Well, Natalie was showing; she's been showing up a couple of years. And ironically, the day of conference, we got notification that she had a baby. Uh, I'm going to say a baby boy, baby girl. It was a girl, but I mistakenly not- sent you an email <laughs> and not knowing the uh, situation, that was in a rush, which I tend to do. Admittedly, uh, sent an email from Kevin's email to all of our staff announcing. The birth of the the wrong the wrong uh, sex. So, Kevin on on the podcast. I, I'm sorry. I made you look foolish, but in reality, it was me. But you took one for the team. You didn't tell anybody until now. You're quiet on that one. Okay. <laughs> anyway, 
So, you got any, anything all I, else? All I know is that later on when I sent out a <laughs> correction, oh, God. that I didn't know about that either. Yeah. <laughs> if you've ever done that before or sent something by mistake, especially on your big boss's email, and you're like, and you, you don't know what to do but clam up, and I, I couldn't go in the corner and cry. We had conference going on. So, oh, I was embarrassed. It was bad. Anyway. Well, we're based in Austin. Yeah, maybe the, <laughs> Keep maybe it the weird. Baby need, the baby needs yeah. time to Well, to that's, that, that is true. That is true. But you got anything else? What is the... Uh, you what, know, you mentioned Shelly. She's in the room with us. I know. I, I know. She is actually running the cameras for us today because uh, because Natalie's on maternity leave. And, you know, again, we this, the staff here, we set, we actually just had this conversation. The staff here at TMPA, uh, me growing up in a very culture environment with my dad working at Southwest Airlines, this is a family. And... Uh, you know, we, we've got some you know great employees that work here, and you walk in here, and it's it's uh it's it's like working with cousins and sisters and brothers, and professionally, and and and, and we do. I tell people all the time, we 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 hire good people. We 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 don't hire or keep marginal employees. We hire good people, and we try to provide them with the best possible benefits and pay we do you know at least every other year we do a whole new market analysis see where we stack up against our competition make sure we're we're paying our people you know enough to hang on to them uh and to reward them for how hard they work uh we our our benefits package i have been told by our brokers we're in the top 10 percent of employers when oh, wow. it comes to the benefits that our board offers to us as employees so so we offer the best possible pay extremely good benefits. We hope it's a good working environment that we offer around here. And then we work you to death. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Come work here. Good pay. But you're work your ass off. So. And Shelly is a great example of that because yeah. she has, since she came to work for us and it's only been a couple of years now, yeah. one year, one that year. all. Yeah. She's, she's wearing so many different hats, Yeah, which includes handling the FOP office Day to day office operation, which can be a challenge. It's not. It's not a pun against Texas FOP. It's, it's just not. a different animal. It's a whole different thing, and 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 we have several employees that are involved in that. But Shelly is uh, is one of the ones that takes on a lot of those responsibilities. Yeah. Uh, she also handles HR functions for us. She handles membership for us. She, uh, I think, she sweeps out the place. To be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's a, it's a, definitely a special group. But you know, like you said, we don't hire. Uh, there's, there's, there's a special blend of character that you need to have to work here. And I mean, this, the, the, the dedication aspect of it. Right. And so, uh, we've got a good team, uh, and it's been, it's been a good foundation built by people like you that serve, served on the board of directors and, uh, past employees. So yeah, it was a good conference. So it was. anyway, uh, you got anything else? Uh, by the way, I think this year's conference for a couple of different reasons, and we're not going to talk about Austin, but y'all will hear the news out of Austin soon enough. But this year's conference, I believe, it, we're going to look back on it and say, yeah, that was a huge turning point right there. I, I think you're right. I think you're right. And it was uh, – I'll leave it at that. Good times. <laughs> Well, if you don't have anything else, uh, man, thanks for the update. Thanks for stopping by. I'm telling you all, I'm 39, about to be 40 in November. Uh, me and my wife were actually talking about this the other day. Our executive director is probably in his mid fifties. I'm going to go with that. <laughs> Leave it there. And you, my friend, need to slow down a little bit. He, this dude, is nonstop, sun up, sundown, Sunday through Saturday, and you can't ever tell. He could end up in Corpus. You're like Carmen San Diego, honestly. And uh, so for you to stop in here and have time for us today, I greatly appreciate well, it. Let me tell you something. First of all, I'll show up anytime you invite me. You, you tell me when I'll be here. Second of all, you make jokes about my age and how long I've been doing this. Tyler and I were talking the other day. When I first started in law enforcement, my brother had to buy my bullets for me. It's crazy. Because I wasn't old enough under federal law to go out and buy my own bullets. And, uh, uh, and then and I started out with the Baytown Police Department. <laughs> Back in 1978, and a couple of months ago, I, I saw a post on Facebook that Assistant Chief Whitaker was retiring from the Baytown Police Department after 38 years wow. with that department. And I looked at my wife and I said, now that makes me feel old, because I never worked with him. Oh, wow. I was gone from there before he even started. Oh, wow. So... Yeah, I'm not in my mid fifties anymore. <laughs> well, but uh, look at where you're at now. I mean, you've had some years of experience, and and uh, 
you are. And, and I've wound up now for 15 years having the absolute best job on her. I, 10 years before that, I was the deputy executive director, but I've now been the executive director for 15 years. And I, there's no doubt in my mind, I have the absolute best job on earth. Well, for me, speaking on me and Shelly's sake, you've, you've made some damn good hires, especially within the last couple of years, within the last 18 months. So I appreciate it. Anyway, well, hey, we're, uh, I think that's about it. We're going to wrap it up. You guys take care. Stay safe. Check our website. Our ledge team is going to be coming up in a couple of weeks and talking about probably Kevin needs to join us on that to talk about our legislative, uh, I guess, agenda coming up for next session. And that's, that's really about it. And if you need anything, give us a holler. We're always here. Yeah. You guys take care. Stay safe. God bless you. And as always, may God bless Texas. We're out.